Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Chinese President Xi Jinping spoke on the phone with U.S. President Joe Biden in a nearly two-hour conversation, marking their first direct communication since their November meeting in San Francisco. What are the major takeaways from the conversation? What's the progress in implementing the agreements reached between the two leaders in San Francisco? And how can the two countries better manage tensions to avoid confrontation and conflict? Join us for our discussion today, live from Beijing. I'm Xu Qinduo. Joining us for today's show are Professor Zhou Gong from the University of International Business and Economics, Warwick Pao, Senior Fellow uh, at the Taihe Institute and the Chairman of Smart Trade Networks, and Jeffrey Towson, Partner at Tech Mode Consulting. Welcome to Dialogue. So, Warwick, I will start with you. You know, this is the first direct conversation, as we said, between the two leaders since their you know, in-person summit in November, San Francisco, last year. So, what's your takeaway of this uh, you know, nearly two-hour uh, talk? Well, I think we've got to put it into some context, and that is that the relationships between the two countries over recent years has obviously been quite fraught. And there have been a number of attempts by the national leaders to um, put a bit of a floor underneath some of the tensions and uh, and to create, I guess, an environment where some dialogue can be reinitiated. And I guess this particular phone conversation is a continuation of that effort, which is to try to create the conditions where dialogue can be maintained and where tensions can be contained. That said, I think that um, it also points to ongoing difficulties in managing this relationship, particularly as we head into an election year in the United States where China bashing and beating one's chest about who's the toughest on China is seen to be a big vote winner. So that's going to be a very difficult context in which we're going to uh, to see the, the, the bilateral relationship unfold for the next 12 months or so. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeffrey, you know, many people say the conversation, you know, is uh, candid and constructive, um, but it's, uh, I mean, it's not a sign of thawing relationship between the two, isn't it? Well, I'm not sure what thawing would look like exactly, but I mean, you did hear from both sides that this is a lot about checking in, uh, keeping the dialogue opening, avoiding any misunderstandings, which, you know, things can happen that can be misunderstood. So it's helpful to have dialogue to sort of check those. Uh, I, I think even though this is a little bit optimistic, I think everybody knows where everybody is. I think the U.S. knows what China is doing. China knows what the U.S. is doing. We're not seeing so many surprises as a couple of years ago. Um, so, you know, maybe staying the course, stability seems to be the mantra for this year. Mm -hmm. Then what are the, you know, you talked about maybe misunderstandings between the two sides. What, what do you refer to? Like, I think it's, you know, strategically it's pretty clear, right? The U.S. is trying, you know, whatever word you use is to contain the rights of China. Well, China is trying to develop itself. Uh, so do you think there's a misunderstanding? I think on the U.S. side, I'm an American, so I'll speak to the American side. Um, it's Things are a bit strange. We don't quite know who's making decisions about what on a day-to-day -day basis like we normally would. Uh, so it's not, you know, you'll hear things coming out of Congress versus out of a cabinet member versus, you know, things are a little less clear, I think, right now than they have been in the past. So, you know, if one random Congress person takes a trip somewhere or says something, you know, that can create um, a response and uncertainty. What was this? Um, so, yeah, the, the U.S. side is a little bit strange this year. <laughs> it has been for a year or so. Even for the Americans, we don't quite know what's going on all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, of course, the Chinese side would complain, you know, there's a, you know, in some area at least, there's a lack of implementation. Uh, despite the agreements between the two leaders, you know, the Chinese side is also wondering, you know, what, what happened. Um, somehow the administration is not following the agreements reached by their leaders, you know, with the Chinese leader. Uh, but anyway, let's move on here. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, according to a readout from the Chinese side, uh, John, uh, President Xi Jinping said, quote, 
the China-U.S. relationship is beginning to stabilize. Uh, but also he warned that, uh, again, quote, negative factors of the relationship uh, have been growing. Uh, what do you make of this assessment? You know, what do you see are the negative factors here? Well, well first of all, uh, let me start by saying that uh, aside from the fact that a lot of issues are very clear on both sides, I think, uh, uh, you know, there's a very good understanding of each, the other side's position, uh, from, both from China's perspective and also from Washington's perspective. But all, I do want to say that there are also imperative issues on the table that are mostly coming from the United States um, against the backdrop, for example, the deteriorating situation in Ukraine, um, you know, from, from the uh, Allied side. Um, and also, um, you know, the prospect of the enlarging war in Israel, uh, you know, just a few days ago, uh, Iranian embassy in Syria was bombed by the uh, Israeli side. And uh, I, I think these are issues uh, that definitely Washington wants to have a conversation with President Xi. Uh, also, for example, there's reports about, um, you know, pending attacks, terrorist attacks uh, against the United States by ISIS-K. Um, and, and I think, you know, in, in areas of cooperation uh, on anti-terrorism, certainly Beijing and Washington uh, have something in common here. So I think, you know, these are the issues that they might be discussed uh, during that conversation. Now back to your uh, question uh, regarding President Xi's uh, statement. Um, I think um, definitely, you know, there are setbacks uh, since the, uh, the summit meeting in San Francisco last year. Uh, for example, um, the uh, Commerce Department continues to introduce sanctions against Chinese companies. Um, and there's also developments, probably outside of Washington, uh, outside of uh, White House control, you know, developments in the Congress, for example, pointedly targeting uh, Chinese companies, particularly uh, TikTok. It was reported a TikTok topic was also raised during the conversation. You know, all these things, um, I think, uh, you know, are, are issues that uh, uh, the Chinese side are very much concerned about. So I think, you know, this is what the President Xi's statement is coming from. Uh, and I think definitely uh, he has a legitimate reason to raise these issues if Washington is indeed asking something uh, from Beijing uh, to cooperate with. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Warwick, uh, it seems like, uh, you know, the conversation probably covered uh, something more than the I mean, uh, topics directly linked to the bilateral relationship like uh, the war in Gaza, Ukraine, and even the possible terrorist attack? Look, I'm sure that over the course of two hours that the conversation would have touched on many topics. As the others have already said, many of the issues and approaches from both sides are known now to each other. I mean, let's not forget that it was in 2021 that Joe Biden made it very clear that as far as he's, he was concerned, China was not going to become a wealthier country or the wealthiest country on his watch. And uh, all the policy actions ever since then have been geared towards achieving that particular outcome. The fact that the US as the global hegemon has masterminded global insecurity debacles in uh, in Europe and now in uh, in West Asia, Middle East, um, I guess is a matter of concern to the US. It's certainly no good for people living in those regions, um, but the US has actually been adding fuel to the fire consistently over the last few years in these areas. Now, I don't know what it is that the US expects um, others to do um, in terms of bailing them out of the troubles that they cause themselves. And, um, you know, the, I'm sure that they'll discuss it, but, um, but at the end of the day, these are problems created by the US and the US needs to find ways out of these problems that actually deliver something meaningful to the people of the regions and to the world as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, well, back to this uh, bilateral relationship. Uh, Jeffrey, earlier you briefly mentioned about, you know, this conversation served, uh, you know, uh, partly the purpose of checking on the progress made after the two presidents' summit meeting in San Francisco in November. So where are we now? You know, how much progress do you see uh, in this relationship here? I mean, things have been stable, I think, for the most part, but I, I do technology, right? That is my area. And, okay, there's been movement there. The U.S. has ratcheted up uh, various types of technology sanctions consistently since November. We, I mean, this, this dial seems to only go one direction. So we've seen semiconductors uh, not being allowed to sold to certain companies. We've seen that expand to manufacturing not being allowed to work with certain companies. We've seen that with 
uh, semiconductor machinery not being allowed to be sold. And now we're hearing things like, you know, chips within laptops can't be sold. So, you know, this is an area where there has been step after step after step. And I'm not, you know, it, this one, I think we can at least see the trend line and uh, it has been ratcheted up. So to answer your question, I'd say that part's negative um, that, you know, this is not good for the relationship. I don't think it really serves the U.S.'s interest long term, or at least if it does, I don't understand it <laughs> because China's doing quite well in developing alternative supply chains and their own technology. Um, shocking many people how well things are going in, let's say, semiconductors and Chinese smartphones. So, yeah, that's a trend line that's not going in the right direction. Yeah, Jeffrey, you know, you made a good point here. Of, of course, you know, probably many of your compatriots, um, maybe they don't understand, you know, the Chinese situation. But anyway, the question people would ask is, like, what is the bottom line? You know, uh, the Chinese side would say this is a never-ending sanctions, you know, on the Chinese side or export bans of, uh, you know, chips there. Uh, so, what is the when will that stop? <laughs> well, when when all that started, this began under Trump, really. It was about trade, right? That was the topic, trade imbalance, trade surplus, and so on. But the moves that were put in place were about technology, right? And it's like, well, how does that relate to trade? That was a bit strange. And then it became its own topic that we need, the US would say they need some controls on technology that might be used in military purposes and so on. Does that really relate to TikTok and kids dancing videos like uh, I know what people are saying <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense to those of us who follow this sector closely um, but to a certain extent you don't need to understand the why everybody knows what's going to happen now every Chinese company knows they need to diversify their supply chain you can't count on this stuff so that's what we've seen over the last three to four years out of China is major moves to develop a lack of dependence or vulnerability on critical technology supply chains coming out of the U.S. Everyone's convinced. So the why doesn't really matter anymore. <laughs> it's everyone's building alternatives. Mm -hmm. Well, building alternatives. Uh, of course, the U.S. efforts continues to join here. Uh, the latest news is that the U.S. is pressuring uh, South Korea mm -hmm. to adopt a similar uh, measures in terms of uh, cheap uh, uh, sales to the Chinese side. Uh, so what's the likelihood like in you know, South Korea will probably you know, do as the U.S. said and, um, you know, probably import, uh, impose export ban on the export to China? I wouldn't um, bet against it because after all, you know, Washington will see tremendous influence of, of, uh, over uh, South Korea. Um, the, the, you, know, you ask the question, well, where is the end, right? I think the end stops at where, you know, Chinese companies caught up catch up catch up with uh, American technologies and then they're gonna give up uh, they it, you know every time the Chinese companies um, move closer to the uh, American technologies the these sanctions will just ratchet up a notch um, so you know Jake Sullivan has this sort of fixation on sort of always keeping a distance uh, a league of distance be between Chinese companies and American companies and he, just, he doesn't quite understand that you know things are moving ahead he doesn't learn from the history uh, with America's own history when America was at that one point subject to this type of similar sanctions by by London and and uh, to, to no fruition at all I mean these measures and policies failed miserably America you know rose above all these sanctions and 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 came to the top and you know go, went up to the top so he didn't learn from this 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 history uh, so so i think uh, you know he just keep trying and he has i mean he is so much invested in this kind of a policy there's no backing for him at all so uh, he cannot back off from this so he would just keep pushing this um, we, we hear more stories of chinese companies successful in breaking through this through that the more we see this kind of a news, the more measures he's going to introduce to, to try to slow down Chinese companies. And, and I think, you know, this is a sort of a vicious cycle um, that uh, it's very difficult to avoid. I think, you know, until the Biden administration 
is gone, as long as they're still in place, Jake Sullivan still is in place, um, this policy is not going to change. It's okay. so much political capital invested in this at this point. Well, if uh, the Chinese uh, companies uh, you know, catch up with the U.S. technology, what will happen? Will the relationship become more dangerous? Well, I think when that happens, he will just go back to his war and, and do some soul searching. I think you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a, it's a. I think at some point it's going to be inevitable. I mean, look at Huawei, right? I mean, there's all so, all so many um, uh, measures, sanction measures imposed on, on, on Huawei. But the company is doing very well, actually. I mean, the, it's coming back. It's to coming back. The with, level of 2019. Exactly, it's yeah. coming back with its own business. It's doing quite well in the infrastructure business, and it's also venturing into other things. He's building beautiful cars, right? So. Um, I think um, you know these kind of uh, measures are, are not going to succeed just by mm -hmm. learning the history lessons mm -hmm. here, right? So, um, but 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 again, I'm, I'm going to say that he's not going to turn back. You know, he, he is uh, he is so he, he cannot. I mean, <laughs> it, it will it will be political suicide for him if he's going to change course. I mean, that's this is the tra tragedy of this thing. Uh, you know, we're just going to be stuck in this track uh, for some time, uh, maybe until the next administration. Okay, one day we will come back and check the. Uh the effects of this, such a policy, of course. Uh, uh, Warwick, uh, here in the conversation, uh, President Biden uh, did uh, reiterate to the U.S. Uh, like a policy, for example, U.S. does not seek a new Cold War with China. Its alliances are not targeted against China. The U.S. follows this one China policy, and it is in the interest of the world for China to succeed. Uh, but the thing is, like, if you check the actions of the U.S., uh, you would find that the actions, you know, some, somehow uh, they, they don't really match with this rhetoric here. What do you make of that? You know, like, um, okay, conversation between the national leaders, um, and probably that's why Xi Jinping mentioned about the three principles. One of them, you know, is, is trust here. Look, the U.S. Um, is suffering seriously from a sincerity deficit and many across the world now are seeing through the difference between rhetoric and action and reality. We're seeing that in terms of the US as policy actions in relation to China, but we're also seeing that in other arenas as well, whether it's in the Middle East or even in Ukraine. So the bottom line is that the US has now reached a point where it says one thing, it always does another, and people around the world are increasingly um, cognizant of that reality. In fact, in fact, it's actually baked in now where I think that, um, you know, people in, uh, are expecting the US leader to say certain things, but at the same time know that something different is going to happen. So what is it worth in the end? Well, you know, in some ways, of course, it's, it's a moderating force in terms of trying to keep a check or keep a lid on some of the issues boiling over but the bottom line is the united states has embarked on a, a policy direction which is geared towards holding back the development of china but not just china but the developing world as a whole and uh, and it will continue doing that i agree with john that there is too much political capital invested in the actions that they've taken they've been backfiring left right and center sanctions have been failing year in, year out, but they're left with nothing else because the idea of collaborating to actually create opportunities for all to benefit is just not possible within a framework that sees America putting itself up on a pedestal and seeing it as the primary hegemon. So here we are. Well, speak of that, of course, you know, uh, to keep the, uh, the status of being the sole Hegemon, uh, not only uh, around the world, but also in particular in the Asia Pacific region. Of course, one issue between China and the U.S. is Taiwan. It's like a permanent uh, question and topic here. Uh, the, the, the Chinese side would say, well, you know, you expect the U.S. side to continue to say, you know, we adhere to this one China policy. But uh, in reality, you do see, for example, Pelosi's provocative visit. That's a president, you know, um, I mean, even U.S. media called it a provocative and the continuous uh, arms sale to Taiwan. U.S. would say that's a defense of uh, democracy. Uh, but then, you know, how dangerous is it, you know, say, uh, looking at the issue from Australia? Look, the fact of the matter is, is that the U.S. has a policy priority to create as much instability um, across the world as it possibly can at the moment. 
it's done it in the Middle East, it did it in Europe, and it's doing it in, um, in, in the Asia-Pacific. The situation in Taiwan goes back many, many decades. The US has seen Taiwan as a critical piece of geopolitical architecture, but it's also been part of America's attempt to redeem itself. After the, uh, the revolution in 1949, um, as many will recall, there was a great debate in the United States about who lost China. And there has been a tremendous amount of hand-wringing about this particular uh, loss, so much so that um, I, I'm sure that there are parts of the US body politic that actually sees the current mission as a continuation of an attempt to regain China back. So uh, I think we're now expecting the US to pursue destabilizing policies and provocative policies. It's what they've done elsewhere. The real issue here is the extent to which they're willing to get close to, to the bottom line, and that is the question of Taiwanese independence. And, um, and everyone knows that that is the one serious red line that could fundamentally change the calculus um, on both sides of the straits. Now, I'm, I doubt that the US will go that close. They're going to push it hard to the edge. They've done it elsewhere but I doubt that they'll go that close to, to pushing over that line. Yeah, and then the point to watch. Uh, you know, back to this, uh, uh, this uh, front of, um, uh, of, of, of like friction here, John, is uh, we earlier mentioned about this, uh, uh, you know, tech restriction from the US on the Chinese side. You know, uh, President Xi in response, uh, you know, basically made it clear to uh, his counterpart Biden that, you know, quote, if the U.S. is adamant on continuing China's high-tech development and depriving China of its legitimate right to development, China is not going to sit back and watch. So what's the message, do you think? This is a clear warning to Washington that China is not going to sit by to watch more and more measures being introduced, especially in the semiconductor uh, industry. Uh, there will be consequences from Beijing's perspective. I think the language is very clear. Uh, and I think uh, Biden probably gets the message. Um, you know, if, you, if Washington expects cooperation in certain areas from Beijing and, you know, you keep doing things like this, it's not going to happen. Very clear. So I think um, the last, the second part of President Xi's statement is very clear. It's, it's a warning, um, in my view. So, um, so I think you know it, it's a matter of whether you know Washington is going to take that message. Um, and I, but but I, to, to be all you know, in, in all fairness, I think um, the Biden administration is also very much constrained. Um, by a lot of political pressure from uh, from, from 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 the Capitol Hill, uh, this is election year. Uh, he's, he doesn't want to be portrayed as being weak on China, um, and um, and there will be a, a lot of Republicans, uh, GOP people, uh, watching very closely his actions vis-a-vis -vis China. So I think um, you know he has a very difficult problem. Um, and, um, and I think his situation is not getting any better. You know, you look at the polls in the United States right now, and he's, he's lagging behind in, in, in Michigan by three or four points, the state that I've been emphasizing is so important uh, in this election cycle. Um, and he's also starting to lose grounds in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. I mean, these are pretty bad news for him. So I think overall, you know, he's in a, in a very difficult situation. I think probably, you know, not just keep pushing uh, these sanction measures against Chinese companies is something that he can probably get away from these GOP watchers uh, without being accused of, you know, being being soft on, soft China. on China. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Right. Uh, well, uh, in any sense, most people would agree, even uh, keep on talking to each other is a good theme. Uh, Jeffrey, we know Treasury Secretary uh, Jen Yellen is coming to China. Uh, so uh, earlier, uh, I think uh, she talked uh, about the Chinese uh, renewable energy, uh, you know, battery, EVs and the solar panels on Financial Times. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what do you expect uh, about, the, you know, her conversation with Chinese officials here? Yeah, this is going to be an interesting topic this year. Um, Chinese EVs are doing very well. They are you know, NEO, Xpeng, BYD, and they're going international. They are everywhere in Southeast Asia. They weren't a year ago. So that has already maybe gotten the attention of um, lawmakers, regulators, competitors for sure in Europe, uh, the US. And this is going to be an interesting. And what can you say? They're really good cars. They're they're priced great. 
that they're really good. Are we going to stop them from coming into the U.S.? Um, so well, we're going to see an interesting conversation when a Treasury Secretary comes and argues your companies are too good. Uh, you know, that will be a big story this year, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Wall Week, uh, well, I mean, that's, uh, that's part of the conversation and also part of the debate between China and the U.S. and, uh, you know, also probably between China and the EU uh, of the Chinese EVs in particular here. Uh, so what do you make of that? You know, uh, well, uh, obviously, you know, if you look at the competition, um, it is a competition. The Chinese uh, car makers, EV makers, they are quite uh, competitive, I mean, with uh, with uh, this supply chain, with this uh, price, uh, uh, so what will be the uh, the outcome? Let's say. Look, Chinese EVs are incredibly competitive, and in terms of quality for dollar, I think that they are, you know, probably even amongst the best in the world, which of course makes them incredibly attractive to, to consumers everywhere. What we've seen in in the Chinese EV space is not only dramatic growth in production. We've also seen, as a resulting part of incredibly intense competition, a reduction in prices, which has driven domestic demand growth. The majority, the vast majority of EVs manufactured in China are actually absorbed by the Chinese market. So the first point in terms of this overproduction or overcapacity issue is really a little bit overcooked. I think the other interesting point about um, Janet Yellen's comments is actually the admission that um, American firms in particular are uh, no longer competitive, no longer cost competitive, and um, uh, and no longer quality to cost competitive, and um, uh, and my comment to that really is 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 don't blame China for that. Take a good hard look in the mirror over the policies of the last thirty to forty years and the progressive deindustrialization and hollowing out of, of American manufacturing capacity. The other point to remember is that the U.S. is high on debt both public debt and household debt, um, is low on savings, which is actually driving a bunch of this importation anyway. So, you know, if Janet Yellen's concerned about Chinese firms bringing the best products at the best prices to market, she'd probably, you know, be well advised to take a good hard look at what's going on in her own backyard before pointing fingers at other people. Mm -hmm. Well, John, go ahead. Uh, yeah. You know, like uh, the acquisition of subsidies, you know, overcapacity. Yeah. Your response? I'll just make one comment. I, you know, I, I, I don't think, uh, uh, I don't, I, I don't agree with Jeffrey that America, uh, Chinese electric cars are going to get into the United States. Uh, even from Mexico, the cars are not going to cross the Rio Grande, in my view. Um, this, this more than just a polit I mean, the, the electric car is more than just a political problem in the United States. It's also a cultural problem, in my view. The American people just are so much attached to the life of the combust internal combustion engines. I mean, there are so many people across the land in the United States that are, you know, fiddling and working with these combustion engines on cars, on tractors, on, 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 on these uh, pistons, on airplanes. Uh, you know, so many people just love the, this kind of a lifestyle. I mean, they love internal combustion engines as much as they love guns in that country. So, you know, Biden, I'm sorry, uh, Trump used to say that um, this is a uh, uh, the electric car lunacy, he called it, okay? So, you know, I don't think that uh, uh, in the United States, the electrification of the automobile industry is going to happen anytime soon. It, it's more than just a political problem. It's also a cultural problem, indeed. Okay, 30 <coughs> seconds. Jeffrey, you want to respond? Yeah, that's, I, I don't agree with any of that. Go to California. There's <laughs> EVs everywhere. You can't, I mean, you can't walk down the street without bumping into one. California is an exception. Oh, oh, yeah. So it depends on the region. It's a good point there. Well, with that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time. <laughs>